So moving on to meta-analysis, uh, these are the sorts of things that we're just going to chat about now. And as with other designs, we have these steps that we need to think through. And when it comes to meta-analysis of ITS studies, we need to keep a few extra things in mind uh, when thinking through them. Um, and we're going to start off with obtaining the effect measures of interest. So as Simon uh, mentioned earlier, um, systematic reviewers need to have the uh, estimates. We need the estimate and the standard deviation. And when we get our primary studies, we need to determine whether or not we can get the effects that we're interested from those studies. And so we might not for a variety of reasons. It could be that they've fitted um, a, a different model that doesn't give us the effects that we're interested in, or so a different model structure. They might also not report the effects that we're interested in. And this, we're going to talk more about specifically about a long-term level change. It might be quite common to report, say, an immediate level change and a slope change, but perhaps we're more interested in a long-term level change and that might not necessarily be reported or it might not be reported at the time point that we're interested in. Uh, and so once we have a think about that, uh, we might decide we need to reanalyze the ITS studies and then you can go back to Simon's slides and uh, see what to do. The last dot point that I want to chat about is uh, what measure, effect measures are possible for a given ITS study. Uh, and this is, again, specifically referring to long-term level change. And this is because we might have a collection of ITS studies that all have different series lengths. And so they might be looking at different follow-up times. So before we get into it, here's another example of an ITS. So we have uh, the outcome of interest is the number of HIV tests, and that's measured monthly. So we have 28 uh, months of data points and within that we have the number of HIV tests for that month and in month 20 we had an interruption which was a mass media campaign and the goal was to increase HIV testing uh, so things like billboards newspapers um, you know TV ads and things like that so now our meta-analysis we have a collection of nine different studies that have all looked at similar interruptions um, and what kind of effects are possible from these, from this collection? So given this, what might we be interested in? So we might be wanting, ideally, to look at a long-term level change calculated 12 months after the interruption. But can we calculate it? So if we zoom in on this study here, we don't have 12 months of post-interruption data. So we could uh, go along to our statistical software, we can plug in this data and we can click run and it will actually spit out a long-term level change at 12 months, but it would be projecting beyond the data uh, that we actually have. And so we might not want to include this in our meta-analysis. And so then what do we do? If we were to continue with 12 months as our time point of interest, excluding all of the studies that don't have 12 months worth of data, we would only be left with three ITS studies. So we might need to consider other uh, lengths of time. So we could look at the time point that is common across all of our series. And because our shortest uh, series length here has four post-interruption data points, that means that you know, the latest time point is the fourth month of the post-interruption um, period. So that might not be ideal. So what are some other options that we could look at? We could calculate the long-term level change at the maximum post-interruption data point. And that means that that time point would vary for each of the series, depending on how much data they collected. So that could be quite long, you know, we could have uh, 20 months of post-interruption um, data, or we could have four. And so then when we come to interpret our uh, meta-analytic effect, we have to make sure that it takes into uh, account that we've got this um, variable length of follow-up. And one more option, perhaps we want to look, try and take advantage of the studies, of as many studies that we have, uh, but also calculating, you know, the um, level changes sort of as late as we can. So here we might be interested in a six-month uh, post-interruption level change. And so that's common across eight of the nine studies. Um, and so then we'd only have to exclude one uh, study. 
So those are just a few options that we have there. Okay, standardization. So because we're dealing with data over time, there are now multiple levels of standardization um, that we would need to think about. So the outcome might need standardizing, so the y-axis, but we might also need to standardize time. So what unit or what time interval our data point is. So looking at standardization of the outcome, we might need to standardize this because the outcome magnitude varies substantially. In some studies, we might have a range here in this example of zero to 60 tests per month, while in others, we might have 1,000 to 5,000 tests per month. So when we go to meta-analyze these on the raw scales, we'll end up with quite large uh, heterogeneity. So standardizing the outcome will help with this. So what do we do? So we have a few options. In other study designs, we might standardize by the standard deviation of the outcome. And this could be limited to the data points in the pre-interruption segment only, or we, and this is akin to um, using baseline only data, or we could use the whole series length. Using the standard deviation though, uh, does not account for differences in trends. So what we could end up with is larger standard deviations and smaller standard mean differences if there are trends. So to account for trends, uh, we could could standardize by the root mean square error of our ITS analysis model. So again, we could um, fit this model to pre-interruption period only or to the entire series. So using the pre-interruption period only means that we don't have to worry about if there's a change in the standard deviation that results from the interruption. So whether or not the standard deviation in the pre-interruption period is different from the standard deviation in the post-interruption period but we aren't taking advantage of all of the data that we have. Um, and if you have a look up into the top right-hand corner, you can see that in some ITS studies, we might have really short pre-interruption periods. Um, and, you know, that's a shame. Um, so what else can we do? We can use the entire series. So using the entire series um, then means that we take advantage of the data that we have, uh, but we do need to bear in mind that we could capture the change in the standard deviation um, that might result from the interruption. Cool, all right. So let's look at uh, what this looks like. So in our example, we have one ITS study here looking at the number of HIV tests. Um, and we're going to standardize by the root mean square error of the model fit to the entire series. So we would fit the model to our ITS data. We would extract the effective interest. So in this example, that's the level change. And then we would divide by the root mean square error from that ITS model. And we would get something like this as our standardized effect estimate. Okay, so standardization by time or of time. So in this example, all nine of our studies are looking at or have monthly data points. So we're looking at the number of HIV tests per month, uh, but that isn't always the case. So here's another example, which is looking at the number of arrests over time. And five of the six studies have monthly data, but one of the six has yearly data. And if you remember from Simon's interpretations of the effects, um, the interpretations are quite uh, are linked with time. So the time interval of our data points is important to how we inter interpret those effects. So remembering slope change, um, the interpretation includes the unit of time. So in this example, we would have some increase or decrease, depending on which study you're looking at, in the number of arrests per month or per year. So what do we do? So we have a few different options. We could firstly go back to the primary study authors and see whether or not we can get the original data and choose the unit of time to aggregate for whatever we would like. Uh, but that might not be possible. Uh, we might not uh, be able to get that data. Uh, we might not get a response. So we could aggregate up to the largest unit of time that we have. So convert the monthly data points and combine them into yearly time points. But the downside of that, and you can see in um, a couple of these studies, in particular the one in the centre on the left, 
is that you might not have uh, enough data points in the pre and post interruption uh, segments once you aggregate into that um, larger unit of time. So we might not have, so in that middle example, we would only have one data, one yearly data point in the pre-interruption segment. So one more option that we might have is to convert the slope change effects from years into months. And so we can do that by dividing, so by analyzing the series uh, using the yearly data points, then taking that slope change that we get and dividing by 12, because there are 12 months in a year, and that would mean, so a decrease of 120 arrests per year would become a decrease of 10 arrests per month. So those are a few of the options there. Um, and now chatting about selecting the meta-analysis method. Uh, so there are lots of different uh, decisions that we have to make at the meta-analysis level. Uh, and starting off with the uh, model, the meta-analysis model, our simulation study showed that a random effects uh, model has improved performance, um, but we might also want to think about how a random effects model might have uh, might be more plausible because we see quite a diverse range of interruptions and populations across ITS studies. Then for the different, um, uh, so the estimator and between study variance estimator and confidence interval methods, uh, we did a simulation study uh, recently and in addition to a couple of other um, studies, shows that the between study variance estimator uh, recommended is REML to be slightly better than the commonly used Ersimonian and Laird um, estimator. And then for the confidence intervals, um, it seems that uh, Hartung Nap Siddick Jonkman is slightly better than the wall type method. Um, but I also just wanted to mention that for um, confidence interval coverage, we found that it was reasonable across the different RAN effects methods, um, and that applied regardless of which ITS analysis method was used. But then when interpreting the estimate of heterogeneity, we did need to keep in mind um, the ITS analysis method. So I won't go more into detail than what I've said there, but the references are down the bottom if you wanted to take a close look. All right, finally, on to retrieving and interpreting the meta-analytic results. So an important part of meta-analysis is having interpretable results. And so earlier we spoke about standardization um, and we showed the example of standardizing by the root mean square error. And that means that our meta-analysis results um, is on the standardized mean difference scale. Um, and personally, <laughs> that means very little to me. I find that quite difficult to interpret so a much more interpretable scale would be to convert back to the original scale, which was the number of uh, HIV tests. And so we can do that by calculating a scaling factor. And the Cochrane Handbook goes through recommendations for selecting that scaling factor. And in other situations, we might have multiple different measurement tools. So, um, but in this example, we have uh, different outcomes that have different magnitudes rather than different tools. So to get a representative uh, scaling factor that we would want to use, we might want to summarize across the root mean square errors that we have across those nine studies. So um, here what we've done is calculate the median root mean square error across the studies and use this as our scaling factor. And when we multiply by that, we get uh, back onto the original scale, which is the number of HIV tests, and that's a more interpretable um, effect. Um, we will also need to keep in mind with that scaling factor choice that it is dependent on, we you know, how, what uh, measure we use. And if you remember from the uh, nine different studies, we did have quite a range of um, uh, outcome magnitudes. So we might also want to keep in mind what it would be if we use the minimum or the maximum root mean squared error. All right, and now on to some of the things that we don't have time to get into today. Uh, so this is just to highlight a couple of those things. So Simon mentioned before the uh, control series, and this provides evidence around, you know, whether we can really attribute the changes that we see in the outcome to the interruption or whether it might be some contemporaneous event that's also occurring. Uh, so there are a range of different control series. Uh, Simon mentioned control, but uh, location-based controls or control outcomes. 
Um, and But also there are a range of different ways that you can incorporate those control series into your analysis, whether it be at the ITS analysis level or comparisons in your meta-analysis. We've also spoken only about two-stage meta-analysis at the moment, but there are also methods for one-stage meta-analysis, so analysing the ITS and combining them and getting the meta-analytic effect all in the one model. Um, but there's still much research to be done in both of those spaces. And finally, we haven't spoken much about sources of bias um, that RTS studies are susceptible to. Uh, so the Cochrane Handbook has a section in Chapter 25 that outlines these, so I'd encourage you to take a look at that. Um, and in terms of tools, there isn't anything specific for RTS, but the Robbins R tool is currently being expanded to include an extension for RTS, so uncontrolled and controlled before or after studies. Great. And lastly, just to finish up, I'd like to highlight uh, the key information that's needed when reporting results of RTS studies and meta-analyses of RTS. So we've seen throughout Simon's discussion of individual RTS and then at the meta-analysis level that the design features of the RTS are really critical. Um, and it's critical to the methods that will be used. So what kind of impact model you've got, the kinds of effect measures you can calculate. It's also important to the performance of the analysis methods. So knowing the number of data points, the interruption time point, the time interval, how long the interruption um, is rolled out for, that's all really important to the analyses and also to the interpretation of the effects that you have. Then at the meta-analysis level, um, we need to know how many ITS studies there are and which ITS are contributing to which meta-analyses. And then for the analysis, we need lots of details to be able to understand the analysis and interpret the effects appropriately. So knowing the model structure is really key to understanding the effects uh, and also need details of how the effects are calculated. Um, so we've discussed a few different ways that you can calculate long-term level change, including um, the time point that it's calculated at. So we need all those details as well. Um, we also want to know about the analysis methods. So Simon talked about the different methods that you can use to account for, uh, say, autocorrelation and also the methods to account for other features of time series data. Then the last few points there are common to other meta-analyses of other designs, but I've put them up there for completeness because uh, they're definitely important. Um, and we did a review a few years ago which showed uh, the you know, um, characteristics of reporting in systematic reviews, and you can have a look at um, if you're interested in uh, how well these different aspects are reported. Excellent. All right, so I'll wrap up. So the key messages to take away from today is that reanalysis of data from ITS studies is possible and possible often, particularly with um, the uh, provision of graphs so that you can extract the data from studies. And this also makes meta-analysis of results from ITS studies a possibility. And they should really be considered uh, frequently in reviews, particularly public health and policy interventions that um, ITS studies might provide the only available evidence or important evidence in addition to other study designs. Um, and hopefully throughout this hour, you've seen that um, there's a need for statistical expertise when undertaking these sorts of um, ITS analysis and meta-analysis of these studies. You know, there's a lot of um, technical things to consider um, throughout their analysis. And so having someone to chat to about that is really important. On top of that, there's definitely a need for content expertise. So to understand exactly what's going on and what you're expecting to see, what you're expecting to happen um, as a result of your interruption, uh, you really need that content expertise and the sorts of things that you need to take into account um, and things like that. Uh, and finally, interpreting the meta-analysis of results of ITS studies requires careful interpretation you need to take into account all of those different methodological issues that we've just talked about um, and keep them in mind when interpreting the effects. So now we've got uh, some time for some questions and feel free to ask questions about both sections. Um, they're kind of together in a sense. Um, and I thought I'd just 
Oh, my picture's gone. Um, I just thought I'd just highlight that if you do have more questions and um, we haven't don't have time to answer them all today, we are actually going to run a workshop at the Global Evidence Summit in Prague in September. Uh, so we'll be there. You can come along, uh, attend the workshop. There's some uh, examples that we can run through um, and you can have a go yourself. But also we're also there to chat. So if you want to come and ask us questions, then feel free. Thank Great. you very much. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Lizzie. Um, and that's a plug, really, for people to go to the GES in Prague. So um, great. Um, there's a really uh, important question from Wolfgang here, um, which is when standardising based on the standard deviation of the data or the root mean square error, computation of the standard error of the standardised slope is more complex than just dividing the standard error of the slope by the standard deviation or the root mean square error. Um, because um, the standard deviation of the root mean square is not a known fixed value, but it's data dependent. Um, do you know if this has been examined? And if so, can you give any pointers or references? Great question. Off the top of my head, um, I don't know for the slope change, no. Um, I do think I can dig out a reference or two from somewhere. Um, that was looking at this sort of issue, but I can't remember it off the top of my head. Great. Okay. Sorry well, about maybe that. You, two of <laughs> you can up. get in contact. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And we've got a question from Kim. Um, thanks for a lovely talk. And just wondering if there are examples of meta analysis using both ITS data and data from before or after studies or from randomized trials. And uh, how would you go about this? Yeah, that's a great question. So there are examples. So we actually looked at a few. A few came up in that review that I was talking about of um, reviews that included uh, ITS studies and meta-analyses. So the examples that we found, um, they had a lot of uh, difficulty finding an effect that they could then combine with the other studies. Um, and that's quite difficult because of just the design of ITS studies. Um, and one of the things that we saw is uh, com combining them with before or after studies. Um, and so you're losing sometimes that slope um, element, just like what Simon said, just averaging the before period and the after period. So not taking into account any of the trends. Um, and uh, so that was one method that was used. Um, but, yeah, it really does depend on what kind of study you've got and what exactly the effect measures that you're interested in and whether or not they're combinable with other study designs. So care is needed. Great. Thanks, Lizzie. Um, and another question I'm going to throw you away. So, again, some congratulations, for Richard, um, around your presentations, which are really useful. Um, his question is that he's encouraged to see your approach works with straightforward univariate meta-analysis. Has there been any research on bivariate meta-analysis of the um, beta 2 and beta 3, so the level and slope changes? And yeah, great question. Really that would be useful. Yeah, great question. Um, so, no, we haven't so far looked at bivariate meta-analysis. Um, we did a little while ago have a look at whether or not there was a relationship between the level and the slope changes. And from what we saw, there wasn't a relationship. So it, bivariate meta-analysis might not necessarily add much um, over meta-analyzing them separately. But that's definitely something that we could look into just to confirm. Oh, yeah, go say, for it, Simon. I'll, I'll... Yeah, I might just pop in and say that uh, when we're doing the, the level change at a later time period, that is incorporating data from both beta 2 and beta 3. So it's not necessarily looking at them in a bivariate way, but it's still combining the information that we have on both of those to come up with that that other metric. Um, so we have seen that used quite, quite often. Right. Okay. So Aphrodite is a question. Um, in case there are significant differences in the number of time points of outcome data or the units of measurement, hence some studies might be excluded from the analysis, do you believe it's worthy of combining their results? Uh, is qualitative synthesis a solution? Not, not entirely sure what the qualitative synthesis would mean in this case, Aphrodite. Maybe you could 
um, perhaps provide a little more explanation for what you would mean there. Um, but Lizzie, do you want to have to? Yeah, uh, yeah. I guess from what I understand of the question is, you know, it might be difficult to find um, a common unit of time or a common um, time point at which to evaluate or calculate the effect measure. Um, so I guess it, we're always trying to do the best that we can with as many studies as we can, um, but it is really tricky to know ahead of time what you're going to get. Um, and so I, I think it keeps coming back to having this hierarchy. So, you know, if you've got a number of things that you're interested in and you can say, okay, well, if we've got the data um, to calculate the 12 month um, uh, interrupt uh, posting, the 12 month level change, level change at 12 months, then we'll do that. But if not, then we'll go with earlier time points and, you know, thinking through the possible um, solutions you might do to get the, um, you know, a, a common unit of time as well. Um, you can think through all of those. But beyond that, I'm not really sure. Do either of you guys have anything to add? Yeah, I think that makes sense. I think having a hierarchy around what you would like to do and then mm -hmm. if you, you do it, if you've got the data available, but, you know, obviously you're always going to be able to do the immediate level change. Um, yeah but you might not be able to do a level change at a further time point. So, yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, okay, you'll see, um, can we use ITS to study retrospective studies with two or more timeline points? I presume that's maybe multiple interruptions. Um, yeah, so let's just go with that being the, I'm not quite sure what the multiple timeline points. So uh, you'll see you might be able to clarify that. But if we assume multiple interruptions, perhaps. Yeah, certainly if we assume multiple I'm... interruptions, we can we can definitely analyze. It's um it's uh just it's as simple as adding a few extra terms to the model to account for later later time time segments. So the seg we looked at a two segment version where we had just one before and after, but if you had two interruptions and you would just have three segments you'd have a before the first segment and then an interruption and then one more segment an interruption and a subsequent one and these are quite common when you want to compare uh, say the introduction of something and then later on it's taken away or uh, or just two events close by to one another and then you can compare the before and after to all of those segments independently so it's a bit more complicated and you definitely want to think beforehand about which parameters you're really interested in looking at. Are you looking interested in looking at how things ended up compared with how they were at the very beginning, or are you interested in the changes in between each segment? Uh, so as Lizzie said before, a lot of this comes down to sort of planning what the research question is uh, in the first place and, and what we're interested in finding out. But yes, we can make models that, that can incorporate that sort of data. Great. Thanks, Simon. And another question, I guess, Simon, which is really related to the, well, both of you, the work that you'd be doing is really around the publication of the correlations for the beta 2 and beta 3, the level and slope change, whether that's been published. Yeah, so I don't think it's published, no, but we do now have a really big collection of ITS data um, that we've put together from, you know, collections, both from Simon's empirical studies, which looked at a bunch of um, individual ITS studies and now we've got a bunch of the ITS studies that we found in those reviews. Um, so we can have a look at um, a more in-depth look of whether or not there's correlation and we can have a look at publishing that. <laughs> yeah, certainly our, our initial our initial look at those studies, which is not super in-depth, showed that there was almost no correlation at all between the level change and the slope change. It um, came up in one of the uh, reviews of one of our papers that we published, but we haven't we haven't published that work by itself yet. No. Right. Uh, and Aphrodite's just confirmed that qualitative analysis uh, she's interpreting just as a narrative description of the results. There, so I'm not sure there's a further question. Um, so, are there any other questions? We've got a few more minutes. Um, I think I've covered off everything that's come through in the chat so far. Um, maybe just a follow-up question for Lizzie. Um, you just kind of briefly touched on this, which was 
you know, the fact that you, irrespective of what analysis method has been used in the individual ITS studies, so some analysis methods may have adjusted for autocorrelation, others not, you tend to get the confidence interval um, having the correct coverage at the meta-analysis level. Um, did you want to kind of talk to why that happens? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? So the simulation study um, looked at sort of um, when you analyse the ITF studies, when you do or when you don't account for autocorrelation. Um, and then when you go to meta-analyse those results, what you what sort of coverage you get from um, the meta-analysis effects of those um, level and slope change. And what we see is that um, you get reasonable coverage um, and that's really because you've got the overestimation of um, or underestimation of the standard errors at the ITS analysis level when you don't account for autocorrelation. Um, and then you kind of add that back in when you get to the random effects meta-analysis. So it all kind of evens out. Um, but what you need to be careful of is then when you've got your random effects meta-analysis um, and you've got your estimates of heterogeneity, if you've not accounted for autocorrelation, actually you get overestimated um, at, at, at estimates of heterogeneity. Um, right. And, yeah, yeah. Right. So, yeah, and that's obviously problematic for prediction intervals and so forth. Yeah. Exactly, yeah.